and it's certainly not an embellishment. It's a practice that creates waves of change in our communities. For every idea begins with a question, and is philosophy but unearths those deep questions hiding within. It is then our passion to answer those fundamental questions. Hello and good morning, everyone. Hello, good morning. And the Humanistic Buddhism Center Philippines and the University of San Carlos Department of Philosophy is proud to present the second Humanistic Buddhism lecture series, of which today the lecture to be given is entitled Humanistic Buddhism Perspective and Prospective. Hello, I am Austin. I am your MC for today. And we have over 101 participants. That is fascinating, frankly, to have these many people join us in an occasion of learning. And any occasion of learning is an occasion of joy. So let's see. How, there, I see people from Ateneo, from Fogongshun. There's, where are these people from? Just shout, shout them out. Shout out where you're from, please, in the chat. Just tell us where you're from. <laughs> it is a wonderful day to see all of you here. To all of you here, and join us. And uh, before any program. Begins though. There are some from De La Salle, from Malaysia, from the LSU Manila. Hello, mga fellow Filipinos. <laughs> We're here in Cebu. We're here in Cebu. It's so nice to have you here. PUP San Juan. Sydney, Australia. Wow. Hello. Indonesia, Taiwan, Perth. Got it. This is truly a global event, and it is a deep honor for our organization and for our co-hosts, the Humanistic Buddhism Center, to have you all here and join us and to take time out of your day to uh, celebrate this uh, lecture and seminar. So uh, so we'll just go on. Okay. So to begin the event, we would like to invite to lead the invocation a special guest. He is an AB philosophy graduate, batch 2013, at the University of San Carlos Cebu. He's a Master of Arts in Pastoral Ministry from the Intercongregational Theological Center, the Graduate School of the Our Lady of the Angels Seminary, Quezon City, the National Director of Carmel Youth Philippines Federation, Convener of the International Carmelite Youth Commission for Asia, Oceania, Australia, Geographic Area of the Order of Carmelites, and lastly, the Director of Carmelite Spirituality Center and Shrine of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Ormoc City. Please welcome uh, Father, Father, Joy, Father Joizel Pinon. Hello, Father. Hello, good morning, everyone. Hello, Father. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, Father, you're clear. Thank you. Um, I, I thank everyone for this opportunity to lead everyone into prayer so we can begin our uh, lecture for this morning. Um, may I invite everyone in a short moment of silence to let us please put our minds and hearts in an atmosphere of prayer and feel the encompassing presence of the divine joining us today in our gathering. Now may I invite everyone, let us pray. God of encompassing wisdom and loving kindness, you reflected, you reflect yourself in all of creation, 
great and small. Thus we raise to you our gratitude for making us one of your creatures that manifest your glory as you have thought and willed us to be. Continue to bless us with your loving kindness that in our own being and in our capacities, we too can manifest to our fellow humans the goodness of our nature, reflecting you in us, who is the source of all good. Accept our gratefulness for seeing us through the night and for opening our eyes this morning to see the light of day. We are grateful for the air we breathe, the land we step on, the water we drink, and the fire that gives warmth to our food that sustains our body and health. Provider of all good things, we rely on your graciousness and teach us to be gracious to one another so we can nurture the gifts of peace, love, and understanding and reject conflict, hatred, and violence. As we gather here today to experience the wonder of your wisdom shining through each one of us, we ask you to bless this moment and keep our minds and hearts open to what gifts each of us can offer today. Let this time be a moment of harmony as we celebrate the presence of each other and appreciate the knowledge that we can learn from one another in pursuit of making our existence deep, meaningful, and worthwhile. We hope that with your presence and providence today, we can reap both knowledge and virtues from our conversations in this gathering and use them to uphold the dignity of our human life and existence so that each of us may continue to shine the light that is present in us, which flows from you, who is the source of all light and goodness. Amen. I thank you all for praying with me, and may this day be fulfilling for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Joyce Del Pinon. What a wonderful prayer to bring this gathering for together and we are going to uh please all stand to honor the national anthem national anthem mga kababayan ang pambansang awit ng pilipinas
Well, hello again, ladies and gentlemen. I am back. Is your I am back. Uh, so we have uh, for transparency, we'll be showing the program flow of this uh, event. So we are going to be proceeding with the opening remarks, and then next to that, we'll have the rationale, then an introduction of our honored speaker and the lecture proper and then after the lecture we'll be having an open forum wherein questions can be given to this can be uh, asked of the speaker and so we actually encourage people to take notes and to focus intently and listen to the uh, lecture with all their attention and then we'll we'll end with the closing remarks speaking of the opening remarks i hope everyone is comfortable and we are all ready to listen. I, so to introduce our, uh, to, inter to give the opening remarks, I would like to introduce the director of the Humanistic Buddhism Center Philippines and the abbess of the Fo Guang Shun Mabuhay Temple, Manila. Please welcome Venerable Miao Jing. Good morning. Uh, we gather here today because we share a sincere thought. We like uh, to first uh, say thank you to our Father Pinoy for the beautiful prayer and set uh, the ground. Um, that uh, this uh, sincere, sincere thought that we share is to focus on allegations in building a better humanity. By transcending moments of ignorance into enlightenment, um, that is to transform all bad thoughts and negativities into positivities um, and hope. Um, so we will be in the humanistic Buddhism to be shared by our speakers uh, today, Venerable Miao Guang. And the uh, Guang in the Chinese means always bright and hopeful. Um, using the three acts of goodness, do good deeds, say good words, think good thought. The four givings to give others uh, joys, confidence, hope, and conveniences, and in building the harmonies around human beings and the world in order to pacify our body and mind to be carefree. And this is how we want to feel our life and our community, places that we live with compassion and patience. And how do we do that? Um, I came from Brunei, a uh, Muslim uh, nation in Southeast Asia. Venerable Miao Guang from Australia and Todd Match, who is our organizer um, today, and also our uh, partners of uh, USC, um, came, and many others from, uh, from Cebu and uh, around the world. Um, this morning, we are here because we have a special affinity with Venerable Master Xing Yun, um, he who passed away earlier this year, yet. June the 12th, two weeks ago, a thousand people uh, from Asian country, the 12 nations uh, came um, to witness uh, his, uh, his uh, kindness here in the Philippines in building Guangming College and the inequations. And last week, week June the 24th, Guangming College has its first graduation ceremony after the pause, uh, after the pandemic. And uh, we have families and friends from across the Philippines to be here. And many said thank you to him and uh, to uh, the work being done because we leave his spirit. Venerable Master Sing in love and peace um, has always been with us. And that is because we have uh, learned from him the mutual understanding, respect in oneness and consistent. This will live on and become the pillar of uh, humanistic uh, Buddhism. Again, as we seen today of, uh, from people in this uh, Dharma assembly. Um, we, since uh, 2010, Venerable Master Sing Yun has invited Filipino scholar and professor to visit Fo Guang San affiliated school in Taiwan. Dr. Uh, Purino, was uh, among the, the first batch of uh, pioneer uh, visitors. Venerable Master Xing Yun then sponsored young scholars from 50 countries over a thousand, a hundred higher education institutions um, to join the International Youth Life and Chance Seminar um, organized by Venerable Miao Guang um, every summer. 
And this uh, special affinity throughout the years has now blossomed and uh, we welcome pools of volunteers, teachers and friends to Fogwangsan temples. We believe in the building of harmony and joys according to the practice from all over the world. Um, Venerable Mel Kuang, alongside with Venerable Master Xing Yun, has uh, went around the world since uh, the turns of uh, this new century. So he, together with him, hands in hands, that uh, he has seen the needs of people um, and uh, know uh, what would be the best uh, for uh, our learning and our human development. Venerable Miao Guang is like a bodhisattva and angels to us because uh, he has lived the loving kindness from Venerable Master Xing Yun and spread it on to others more often here in the Philippines than anywhere else. So we have seen how he has uh, translated Sihata the musical to Venerable Master Xing Yun um, personally. And now Sihata the musical has uh, been to 15 countries perform um, over a thousand, uh, 150 shows. Uh, our director, the newly, uh, the new director for the school versions this year, hi, Sir Jun Ray. <laughs> and uh, we also, uh, he, she, Venerable Miao Guang has also lectured at the uh, Guangming College and uh, our humanistic uh, Buddhist uh, lecture series here in the Philippines uh, across uh, our different temple. She who translate the work of a Buddhist uh, dictionary has bring together a theme here in the Philippines as well. Now, Venerable Miao Guang together with us has uh, seen how Guangming College has grown into three campus in Cebu, Manila, and now the Takaitai. Uh, we also, um, how all of uh, this work over the decades that has bring about the Humanistic Buddhism Center um, Philippines as uh, organized and uh, found the founding uh, committee are also here today with uh, Dr. Manika and Dr. Korea. And uh, Venerable Miao Guang, as uh, the deputy directors of our Institute of Humanistic Buddhism, has always been at our back. Um, we would, huh, with the recommendations of our head abbots, Venerable Yong Guang, and our deputy directors, Venerable Miao Guang, that uh, we come together to diligently uh, deepen uh, our understanding and our work for the Philippines and for the people's love. Um, as humanistic educator, as partner in human development, as a Catholic and Buddhist, uh, Buddhist and non-Buddhist uh, friends and spiritual fellow practitioners, that thank you for being here, for being a family and making this world a happy and warm place like the sunshine. Ong Yito Kong. Okay, thank you so much for the heartwarming opening remarks, Venerable Miao Jing. And to kick off this seminar, I hope everyone is comfortable, everyone is ready, everyone has a smile on their face, ready to get some learning. So we're going to be starting off to kick off this seminar. We're going to have the rationale and the introduction of our speaker to be given by the Uni University of San Carlos's very own Dr. Majori Borino. Thank you, Austin. Auspicious day to everyone in Zoom. Thank you for attending the Humanistic Buddhism Center Philippines Lecture Series. The lecture today is actually the second installment of a threefold series for the year that is initiated by the Humanistic Buddhism Center in cooperation with the Department of Philosophy of the University of San Carlos. The agenda is really to cultivate the culture of academic research on humanistic Buddhism. But why humanistic Buddhism? Humanistic Buddhism is a modern movement within Buddhism that emphasizes the practical application of Buddhist teachings in everyday life and social engagement. Venerable Master Sing Yun throughout his life was earnest in cultivating a kind of Buddhism that stays relevant with modern times. 
Thus, humanistic Buddhism addresses the challenges of the modern world and apply Buddhist teachings to promote individual well-being, social harmony, and global peace. The first lecture of the series that happened last April paved the way for the discussion and was aptly called Affinities and Pathways, a dialogue between Buddhism and philosophy. Today, our lecturer will be talking about humanistic Buddhism perspective and perspective. It is hoped that through her lecture today, we will all be encouraged to join in the conversation and explore ideas on the timeliness and maybe even timelessness of humanistic Buddhism. The aim, of course, is to receive future researches, responses, commentaries, and even critiques that will comprise the third humanistic Buddhism lecture series that will happen sometime in October or maybe November. So without further delay, allow me to introduce our speaker. Venerable Miao Guang was a personal interpreter of Venerable Master Sing Yun, founder of Fo Guang Shan. She is also the Deputy Chancellor, Fo Guang Shan Institute of Humanistic Buddhism in Taiwan. Venerable Miao Guang is an adjunct associate professor, Department of Religious Studies, Nanhua University, and the director, Fo Guang Dire Dictionary of Buddhism, English Translation Project. Venerable Miao Guang is known and well admired well within the Buddhist community as well as in the academic circles for her contribution in Dharma propagation through cutting edge lectures, inspiring Dharma talks, translation initiatives, and her Body Tales podcast series. Colleagues and friends, please welcome our speaker, Venerable Miao Guang. Thank you very much, Dr. Perino, and thank you, Venerable Miao Jing, for your kind introduction, which I feel undeserving and humbled by your kindness and your support. And also, once again, to Father Pino for the beautiful prayer, which I share much affinity in as I listen to. In the encompassing presence of God and Buddha's compassion and blessing, I express my gratitude for the opportunity to gather here together with all of you so we can learn from each other. I'm also like to express my gratitude for the opportunity to share my humble experiences in humanistic Buddhism. And furthermore, I would just like to say a big thank you to the Humanistic Buddhism Center Philippines in conjunction with the University of San Carlos Department of Philosophy uh, for and also to Venerable Yong Guang, as well as to Madam Manikan, for all of your efforts and support in the establishment of the center. Uh, I'm very excited about the center and also very honored for being able to be a part of it. Today, I'm here to share my learnings and thoughts about humanistic Buddhism, which I coined humanistic Buddhism perspective and perspective. Well, um, I named it this way because this is my first opportunity to deliver a lecture on behalf of the Humanistic Buddhism Center. And I also appreciate the opportunity for um, everyone to really hear about where I came from and what I'm a part of, and also where we're headed in the future under the wisdom and the faith called Humanistic Buddhism. So I divide my talk <coughs> today in two parts. First of all, perspective, which is the point of view that uh, I would like to share about what humanistic Buddhism is. And the second part will consist of perspective, which is usually mistaken and mixed up with perspective, because perspective actually means what to expect. So as we understand, Buddhism is a rather empirical teaching. It's an empirical doctrine, and it relies heavily on actual practice and experience for us to understand where the Buddha came from and where the Buddha wants us to go. And so it is impossible to cover perspective of humanistic Buddhism before we lead into where we are now and where we will go all together. 
So humanistic Buddhism is pretty much like a movement that began in the 20th century. A century that faced many challenges and witnessed the turning points of humanity. And but we were very fortunate to be accompanied by the Buddha's experiences, where he presented a journey of awakening so that we are able to confront all of these 20th century challenges in the company of Buddha's wisdom. And so what happened in the 20th century before we now lead into the 21st century? In the 20th century, humanity was threatened by terrorism. Humanity was barely becoming free from dictatorship. We were also threatened by the spread of nuclear weapons, which were pressing global issues. This meant that the world during those days was still blighted by small scale wars around different parts of the world. And in countries that were a little more fortunate not to be influenced by wars, we were still overclouded by violent conflicts between races, between groups, between religions, between cultures. And these were only fueled by competition over resources and by ethnic conflicts. These were all very, very difficult challenges for us to overcome. But somehow we pulled through. I'm not sure if I could say we pulled through with high flying colors, but nevertheless, we pulled through in the company of the Buddha's wisdom. But what was the Buddha's wisdom? As we say, if we never coined Buddhism as a religion, it was more or less a journey of enlightenment an enlightenment that is attained through an understanding of the self and of reality, where we gain a higher insight and perspective to rise above all of these challenges. But did we manage to do so in the 20th century? Unfortunately, I would say no. We're still going through very difficult times. We're still going through struggles. And so that was exactly the kind of Buddhism that I witnessed as I grew up in Taiwan and in Australia. So allow me to uh, brief you on what I actually witnessed. That were the 20th century's challenges that overclouded life in Taiwan. Well, the issues of identity, culture, politics were nonstop for people in Taiwan. And so starting from as early as the 17th century, we could already see that life in Taiwan was overclouded by the Dutch occupation, the reoccupation by Zheng Chenggong, and then the Manchurian conquest of China, which then led to the Japanese occupation in 1895, followed by the Civil War, which was a major clash between the KMT and the Communist Party. And none of this made life easier. In other words, life in Taiwan going up to the 1950s, we were barely recovering from the civil war. And we were barely recovering from the after effects of the Japanese colonization. In other words, Taiwan was going through that constant struggle of identity. Were we an independent country? Or are we a part of China? Or are we a part of the Japanese or the Dutch colony? It was unending. And so how we grew up in terms of the variety of culture, language, the constantly changing lifestyle all depended heavily on what had been brought into Taiwan. In other words, in the 50s, it was rather chaotic and unstable for most people. And before religion actually came into play any important parts, what was more important was for the daily, meet, daily needs to be met. For example, we were, people were still relying on food voucher. Families were given a box of egg for a week. They were only given a slice of meat for a week, and they had to sustain the family through that. Material needs were scarce. Safety was a huge issue. And so the reliance on religious needs were not so much about the journey of awakening, but rather for short moments of safety, condolence, reliance, and sometimes even escape. That's how humanistic Buddhism began to come into shape. 
And so pre-humanistic Buddhism, which I coined during those days, are divided into four major stages. First of all, the merge with folk beliefs, which I believe is quite similar to what Buddhism in the Philippines went through in the past 30 years. Then came the vegetarian sect, the Zai Jiao, which embodied the development of religious leaders who were mostly lay, untrained, and barely monastic. Then there came the effects of the Japanese occupation. And then finally, as we emerged through a moment where Taiwan began to establish its own identity, once again, Buddhism relied heavily on the focus on services and rituals to meet the daily consolences, the daily escapes, the moments of safety and reliance, which these rituals somehow offered. So the merge with folk relief began with the entrance of the Southern Chinese Chan Buddhism that came from Guangzhou. And most of these folk Buddhist beliefs encompassed mainly prayers and rituals and even divination and blessings so that they find a moment of guidance based on fortune telling, based on clearance of our karmic hindrances. And all of these guidances came with a mix of Taoist and Buddhist faces. These faces lacked orthodox Buddhist lineages. We don't know where they came from. And nevertheless, the people in Taiwan relied heavily on all of these prayers, rituals, divinations and blessings because it somehow provided re relevance and essential support to the daily needs of Taiwanese people. It solved their daily fear. It fulfilled their daily needs. That's how it came, came across. And so this is what religious practices that combine folk belief and Buddhism look like in the 1950s. A good mixture of Taoist belief, folk belief, and little Buddhist belief. And the only traces of integration with Buddhism is when we go inside and we see the statue of Maju, right, the goddess of sea. In front of her, you would see Guanin Bodhisattva, who is regarded as the teacher of Maju in delivering sentient beings. And if we're lucky, we see statues of Amitabha Buddha, who offered deliverance to the pure land, who gave once again a moment of solace from the cool reality of real life. So this big mixture uh, really gave no definition to what Buddhism was, because you are introduced to this large array of gods, deities, Buddhas. So in here on top, you will see maybe a statue of Amitabha Buddha. And on the bottom left hand side, you see this white, smiling, chubby statue of Maitreya, who offered a moment of joy and blessings. But there's definitely no presence of Sakyamuni Buddha. This is how we grew up. And what did we do when we visited the temple? We didn't chant sutras. We didn't pray to the Buddha. Instead, we went through divination. We went for these fortune-telling sticks for guidances from the Buddha on how we could grow up in peace and safety. And so you get these sticks. You pull up the stick, it has a number, and you go to these drawers and open up your corresponding number and you pull up a fortune-telling slip, which basically makes no sense to you because it's in classical Chinese, and but it somehow guided you towards an ethical life. Or if you didn't go for the sticks, these were the crescent shaped wood blocks that gave us divinations or instructions coming from the deities. Is it okay if I get married in May? Is it okay if I do that? And so the elderly in Taiwan heavily relied, relied on the divination practices to re receive some kind of instruction so that they feel okay to proceed with life, especially in the rites of passage. And so it worked this way. Basically, if the crescents face the same direction, it's a no. Should I get married in May? If you get them facing the same direction, no. So you have to get the crescent shaped blocks facing different directions, one up, one down, three times in order for this to become a yes. And so the divine instructions were the main forces of direction and guidance in the 1950s. And what more? If you go to this fortune telling street in Taiwan, you get a variety of fortune telling um, techniques 
to teach you how to name your children. Um, there are even tarot cards to show you what you should do regarding your roman romantic relationships, how to pursue your career, or there are even a uh, face fortune telling. Or if you threw a bunch of rice into three different uh, dishes, there were people who, according to the instructions of Yi Jing, will tell you what's about to come up for you in life. Okay. We all believe in all of this, and that was religion for us. Somehow it was partly folk religion, it was partly Buddhism for us. And later on came Zai Jiao, which were mainly temples organized and led by unmarried single ladies who conducted chanting services. But they barely received any training. Uh, you would regard them as the religious ladies who observe vegetarianism. And so these vegetarian sects uh, were each an integration of Buddhism, Taoism, Neo-Confucianism, as well as local religious beliefs. And as they are administered by lay people, independent of the Sangha community, uh, really the followers relied on mutual support and service between clergy and laity. So why is the lack of Orthodox Buddhist lineages a, a, an issue for these ladies? Because they cause a confusion between Buddhist monasticism and laymen. And even more, there came the Japanese occupation. Basically, the, 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 the Japanese occupation became a way of observing the actions and the movements of the people through the spread uh, and organizations of the temple. In other words, if these temples did not offer loyalty or show loyalty to the Japanese government, um, there's no way of organizing and maintaining this temple. So somehow, one way or the other, these temples began, began to follow the Japanese Buddhist traditions in the chantings and the clothing and in sharing information about what the people in Taiwan were doing. And so this came, there came the suppression of the religion after the Xilai An incident. Basically, it was an opposition by the um, indigenous Taiwanese people who were trying to overthrow the Jap Japanese government. And so they gathered inside temples for meetings and that's where they collected their resources for the, uh, the reform and the revolution. But unfortunately, they were caught by the Japanese people, the government, and many were beheaded. And so from that moment on, um, the management and the observation of the temples in Taiwan became even more strict. Okay, so the Japanese government laid a very, very heavy um, rule over these temples. Japanization, Japanization and the more effective monitoring and control over temple meant that there was mandatory association with the Buddhist sects. And so just that alone, you start to see people in Taiwan wearing monastic robes that reflected the Japanese traditions. For example, the third uh, person on, from the left in the front row, that's how a Japanese monk or a priest dresses up. And whenever you dress up in this, they know you are part of their people. You are assisting in their monitoring and controlling of the Taiwanese people. And so what are the positive effects? The positive effects included that it somehow created a, a creative process through which a sense of identity for Buddhism in Taiwan was developed. They began to dress uniformly. They began to chant similar sutras. And it closed the gap between Zai Jiao and Orthodox people. You started to see this is what Buddhism in Taiwan looked like. And then going further into the late 50s, in the early 60s, there came focus on services and rituals, Jing Chan Fo Jiao. And services and rituals became a predominant way of practice, where it included recitations of the Buddha's name, Omitofo, 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 for rebirth in the Pure Land. And there were chanting services or deliverance rituals to, to deliver the dead. It was almost an everyday need for people because people were dying every day. They needed deliverance. They needed a way to go after life. And this is where Jing Chan Fo Jiao came in. And charitable works were also a very easy way to accumulate merits, which was a huge thing for people in Taiwan because they believed the only way to lead to a better future life is to accumulate your merits. And so these deliverance practices included a lot of offering and giving to the dead. 
So in Luna July, we will gather on the streets to make food offerings. We will in, uh, be, become involved in the chanting services to deliver the dead. But as the demands for this became so high, and there were so little trained monastics, this is what happened. An increasing number of lay clergy became involved in these rituals, which were interesting because people believe that the only way to deliver the dead, you must be fully trained. You must be monastics who observe precepts and were celibate in order to have enough blessings. So how would the lay clergy actually be qualified enough to deliver the dead? It was a huge question. But nevertheless, this heavy, heavy in, uh, emphasis on services and rituals became a way for Dharma propagation that remained all the way into the 60s, the 70s, and even the 80s. But misunderstandings arose because people continued to believe that the only way for you to accumulate merits were, to through, were through these rituals, through life-releasing rituals, which was quite interesting because where would these animals come from? Right. Business people saw an opportunity and began to capture all these wild animals, turtles, birds, trap them in cages, sold them to these religious organizations for deliverance services. But these deliverance services were not conducted properly. And so you see these buckets of fish. Turtles were poured into dry ponds, which only killed more life, which indeed isn't correct and were I guess pretty much unethical. So Jing San Fo Jiao, or the focus on services and rituals, uh, once again, uh, manifested this heavy dependency on services and rituals, where the monastics chanted for offerings and money. And they were receiving payments for conducting services. It was a main source of income. And as it became easier and easier because of the high demands, monastics began to avoid the difficult task of teaching the Dharma, which caused disrespect for monastics. And so as Venerable Master Xingyun arrived in Taiwan in the 50s, he saw and began, he saw the problem and began to provide solutions, not by overthrowing existing rituals or practices, because people were so used to it. Instead, he skillfully instilled Dharma teaching into these chanting services and rituals. He didn't say, stop chanting, stop organizing these rituals. Instead, he said, okay, do it. But at the end of the day, spare 15 minutes to listen to me and learn about what you have just been doing. Learn about righteous belief and righteous practice. And so this began to raise higher awareness in the spiritual needs of the living rather than that in the deceased. What we saw as at the dawn of humanistic Buddhism, especially in the 50s, was a turning point when people realized, hey, the focus should really be on the living rather than the dead. It should be on human beings rather than on releasing pigeons, turtles, wild boars in order to accumulate merits. And so the general impression of Buddhism in Taiwan, starting in the 60s, began to turn, <clears throat> it began to turn. It began to turn from a moment when we focus on largely otherworldly, for example, afterlife, deliverance of the dead. And then we began to see hopes placed in better future rebirth. That's the first thing. But nevertheless, it was just dawning. It was just dawning on the people that there were many issues and confrontations to be resolved. So during those days, it was still a rather this organized group of Buddhists who had very little influence. In other words, monastics and clergy were marginalized and they were politically and culturally disassociated. They showed very little concern about what society was going through and they disassociated their daily practice to the social issues. In other words, even in this period, the Buddhists in Taiwan were still rather behind in the ways of Dharma propagation. So there were misunderstandings about Buddhism. For example, journey to the West. Monastics were timid. They had no rights of judgment because whenever the pig told on the monkey, right, the monk would just chant a hot sutra to punish the monkey. It was ridiculous. Or when we came across Dream of the Red Chamber, Hong Lo Mong, people would think that only people who you know, have bad romantic relationships 
who have lost their loved ones really proceed to the life of monasticism. But this is not true because the reform came about in the presence of these masters, Master Tai Xu, Master Yuan Ying, Master Xu Yun, and Master Miao Guang, Ying Guang. Okay. And these were the Buddhist monks who brought in a new wave of Buddhist movement. Basically, these were the changes. First of all, a change of monastic life. Monastics began to realize that only the fully trained one and the fully ordained ones would be observing celibacy. They would observe vegetarianism. They would have shaven heads. They would display proper monastic attire and they would be fully ordained through ordination ceremonies before they could actually enforce the etiquette or the practices of Buddhism. Buddhism. And secondly, these masters changed religious mentality. More thoughts were given on how to revitalize this ancient religious faith. As I have said, it's more about the journey of awakening rather than the solution of karmic hindrances and better accumulation of merits. And we needed to ensure the survival of Buddhist monastics through proper training, proper practice, and righteous belief so that a future social position for Buddhism can be secured. And so that being said, I have to say Buddhism in the 21st century is pretty much a type of Buddhism that had the journey of awakening crudely interrupted by real life. Because society was just forming and the identity of Buddhism was just establishing there's really no room or space for awakening for, to any of these people. You have to survive first. Okay? You have to make sure the daily needs are met. You have to be accepted by society first. So if you dwell deeply and directly into meditating, finding awakening, then Buddhism would never find a place in this world. So that's why Master Tai Shi saw the need to really integrate Buddhism and everyday life. He was a pioneer. He was, he was a reformist. And his main ideas were about the fact that you don't need to really look into rebirthing a pure land for the next life. What you do is in the here and now. If you live life well in this life as a human being through ethical deeds, in the guidance of the 10 meritorious deeds, Susan Ye, and also to befriend eminent ones who can travel in the three vehicles, the Sarvaka, Pratyeka Buddha, who follow orthodox doctrine, and for the Bodhisattvas who set out to free oneself and others, then a pure land could be right in front of you. So this was a whole new mentality back in those days. But he says it's not impossible because the attainment of Buddhahood begins with the perfection of your human character, which comes from the purification of your three deeds, verbal, physical, and mental deeds. And that will lead to the perfection of the human character. And if we do that, then of course, Buddhism can be a totally different experience of awakening as a human being for all of you. In other words, what he wanted to say is that Buddhism is not a religion for the dead. It is not a religion for ghosts. Rather, it's about us as human beings who practice Buddhism, not to die a good death, but to actually live a better life in the here and now. So the huge turning point tells us that as human beings, what we do is instead of trying to strive for a good death, why don't you strive to understand the meaning of life now? And by doing that, you must first acknowledge what society is doing for us and what we can do for society in return. So in conclusion of Tai Shi's entrance into the picture of humanistic Buddhism, we see his three major intentions. First of all, to correct corrupt practices of Buddhism. Second of all, to clarify misunderstandings of Buddhism being a religion for the dead and to restore the good tradition of Buddhism, which focuses on improving real life in this world. So that set and paved the foundation for humanistic Buddhism, which we're about to enter. But let me remind you, reforms are not easy. Reforms are always coupled with resistance. 
even to this day, when we're trying to understand the practice of Buddhism, as we teach the 21st century Buddhist mentality, we experience resistance. What kind of resistance is this? Let me use an analogy. This is the first computer that came out in the world. It came out in 1942. Very early, it was about four tons that took up the space of a whole room. It included 10,000 tubes that were connected to every uh, part of the computer. And this computer came up to a massive memory space of two megabytes. Okay. Huge, tremendous. Okay. So back in those days, people were introduced to the computing world thinking this is special. Okay. But if I was to ask you, can you please email me with this computer? You must think me crazy. Okay, so I'm gonna upgrade this a little bit and move to the very first Macintosh computer that came out in the 1980s. Right, it was the first computer that used a mouse and a cursor. Right, so it involved an interaction of your hands that reflected on the screen. As you move the mouse, the cursor also moved. Okay. So it's about much better, isn't it? Much more advanced. It was connected to the internet. So again, I ask you to email me with this computer. You would think, okay, nobody uses 3.5 inch floppy disks. Okay, hello, venerable, wake up, keep up with the steps of time. So I said, fine, you know, how about phones? In the 70s, we had these bricks, right? Only very successful businessmen had the opportunity to carry these mobile phones around with them. So if you see anyone carrying this on the street, it must be a CEO making a lot of money who needed to be contacted any moment. But I'd say, call me on this phone now. And again, you would say, you must be crazy. So upgraded a little bit. What about the smaller bricks right? that made men look really cool and fancy? And I said, call me on this phone. You will shake your head at me. So, okay, upgrade to iPhone. And he said, that's more like it. Okay, venerable, I can contact you. I can talk to you now. We can communicate. So th these are the kinds of resistance we experience today when we say humanistic Buddhism is now going to move towards a space outside the shrines, off the cushion, away from the sutras, but into real life where we resolve everyday issues such as family issues, work issues, personal issues, and global issues. They will say, no, 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 no. You Buddhists are supposed to use these old gadgets. Okay? That's the only way for me to realize you are a truly trained Buddhist. But it's not because today, Buddhism in the 21st century, coming from the after effects of the 20th century, we see Buddhism is being regarded in three ways. Well, basically in, in the East, let me say in East Asia, uh, most Asians, especially mainland Chinese Asians, still see Buddhism as a religion to pray for a better life. So the bigger incense you offer, the greater merit you, you get. But for Westerners, this has become a philosophical journey where George Berkeley began to dwell and explore the teachings of Buddhism in a psychological way, where he says, well, it's a, it's an, a whole experience about how we live through the human sensoriums. So he started to explore Buddhism through this question. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? And for anyone who relies on experiences, you would tell me yes. But as a physicist, he would tell you no, it doesn't make a sound. Why? Because sound is the vibration of air that travels through, through space. And this vibration is actually caught by your eardrums. And when these vibrations through your eardrums are passed into your brain, then you establish that this is a sound. Only then will you hear a sound. So if a tree in a faraway forest where you're not present falls, you will not hear any sounds. This is how Western, Westerners, psychologists, philosophers in the West begin to explore the meaning of humanistic Buddhism. But what about the rest of us? If I'm not a physicist, if I'm not a scientist, right, if I'm living life well, right, I'm not experiencing pressing issues about life and death, what do I need from Buddhism? 
it's just about a better family life, isn't it? Where I can coexist with my family members. We understand each other with loving kindness and compassion. And then we lead you know, a smooth, joyful, and happy everyday life. That's all we need to do. If that's what we're after, then Venerable Master Xing Yun comes into the picture through contemporary Buddhism in Taiwan by founding Fo Guang Shan, where we see the difference between Fo Guang Shan temples. First of all, is a shift away from the statues of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas as dominant figures. In traditional Buddhist temples, you would actually see these statues enshrined in the dead center of a shrine where people have to walk around it. It's usually dark. It's usually very narrow. But at Foguangshan, the shift towards humans, where Venerable Master believes that the space for shrines are for human beings to come in, to connect with the Buddha through the act of chanting, laying prostration, meditation, or simply just sitting down in quiet solitude, gazing upon the Buddha to receive moments of consolence and compassion as well as blessings. So the space is actually for humans. And even more, monastics in temples begin to reach out into schools. Buddhism has become a Buddhist education for children in all areas. So it's a great care and concern for the younger generation in their opportunity to create an educated and knowledgeable future. So these mobile trucks are being dispatched to remote areas. So children have a chance to actually learn by reading. And at the same time, Venerable Master showed concern to the local farmers who were neighbors to Foguangshan. Because these neighbors, although they were farmers, they knew how to grow lychee. They didn't know how to sell lychee. So in most cases, they were usually exploited by wholesalers. And so in order to make sure that they earn what they truly deserve, as these mobile trucks reach out to remote areas, to schools, into streets, into communities, the truck drivers also learn to deliver the wonderful produce of our local township. And they found ways to interact with the local people as well. And so this is a huge shift between traditional rituals to actually reaching out stepping into society to show kindness and compassion of Buddhist. And Venerable Master not only did that, he also established the Buddhist Light International Association, which primarily consists of lay devotees. These lay devotees take on leadership roles. They take on decision-making roles. They execute the Dharma propagation ideas alongside the monastics. And so that we discover that Buddhism is no longer exclusive to monastic practitioners, but it has become a universal life experience for anyone who has a family. So even householders have the chance to experience the joy, the liberation, and the accessibility of Buddhism. Families are brought into temples, not for the difficult practices of meditation, or chanting or the study of doctrinal issues, but they were simply there to share moments of family moments together. So you will see in these cases, instead of chanting services, we see cheer squads, choir, right, Sunday gatherings for families covering all ages. They were able to just enjoy being together. They have something in common about the religious experience. And at the same time, it's not difficult. It's not exclusive. It becomes inclusive and universal. So this largely steps away from the traditional teachings uh, and practices of the Dharma, and it becomes much more relevant to our everyday experiences. And the third thing Venerable Master Xingyun did was the founding of the Buddha Museum, which were formerly known as the Buddha Memorial Center. If you walk into the Buddha Museum, it's not a religious museum. It's a park. It's an educational experience once again. It's a chance to learn about nature for families all together. It's also a chance 
for religions to come together to celebrate our togetherness, to celebrate our common goal of the sharing and giving of love. And so in this gatherings, which is also held on Christmas Day, Venerable Master Shinin calls it the reunion of religious associations. The deities, the gods, which people worship, are invited to come together to celebrate and to share our experiences. And in one of the years, um, the Santo Nino from Cebu was also invited to come to the Buddha Museum, right? which was a truly beautiful moment for us to learn more from one another. We saw the smile, we saw the jo joy, and we appreciated the beauty in all and every religion, no matter what. So this is the kind of 21st century Buddhism that we are stepping into when the journey of awakening no longer will be disrupted by reality because today we live a more abundant life. It's much more convenient. For one way, most of us live a much more stable life, less affected by war. But our hearts are still with the less fortunate people in the regions who are still under the threats and the cruelty of war. We wish for that day of stability, abundance and joy to come for them too. But for us, when we enjoy that, what we look into Rendian Fo Jia or humanistic Buddhism becomes a much more holistic presentation of the entire Buddhist religion that holds but one single aim. That is the well-being of individuals, families, societies, and the entire world. So coming to this point, what is humanistic Buddhism? Venerable Master coins it as a teaching that was taught by the Buddha, needed by human beings, that purifies and beautifies. So as we speak of this, basically the word humanistic has to cover some levels of Buddhist humanism. And so what is Buddhist humanism? Let's look at a couple of things. First of all, it places an emphasis on the uniqueness and the unavoidability of being human. To experience and to benefit from humanistic Buddhism, first of all, live as a healthy and a wholesome human being. That's what you need to do. Why? Only humans have the capacity of receiving and implementing the Buddha's teachings because we have the most intricate intelligent system within us that can transcend AI, that can transcend the greatest mysteries of the universe, if we give ourselves an opportunity to experience a moment of awareness and unity with the rest of the universe, the world will open up to you. Everything opens up to you through the Buddhist teachings. And when you receive these teachings, you establish through the unique capacity of human beings, the development of bodhicitta, that is, this awareness to benefit both just the self, not just the self, but also for others. And in other words, in the humanistic aspect of Buddhism, we must pay attention to a couple of things. If we want to achieve all of this, the bodhicitta, deliverance for self and other, and the unique experience of establishing this in intelligent system that gives rise to awareness, first of all, we must avoid indulgence in metaphysical teachings. For example, where the world come from? Where did the world come from before I was born? What will the world become after I die? These would not be the primary concern for us. The primary concern for us now would be how do I become awakened to the great unity and oneness of myself and the world? And second of, all, second of all, the Buddha's claim to be human, humanistic, again, emphasized the fact that we experience everything as a human being through our human sensoriums. So we receive and open up this greater ability to become aware and observe this world. We do all of this for one thing, liberation of humanity. So the definition of humanistic Buddhism being coined as what the Buddha taught, it's got to come from the instructions of the Buddha. And secondly, if it's not relevant to human beings, if whatever the Buddha taught cannot help us resolve our everyday issues, then it's not what we need. 
you can walk away. You can ignore it. And what causes us not to walk away or ignore humanistic Buddhism? After our experiences of the teachings, we realize it engages us in the process of mental, physical, and verbal purification that leads to the wholesome life of an ethical human being, which makes us our life much more virtuous and beautiful. It is actually done through the levels of the five vehicles. In other words, you can be a human being, and if you still strive for a future rebirth in the heavenly being realm, you're still involved as part in, as a part of the picture in humanistic Buddhism. At any moment you decide to, tra- decide to transcend human desires, you become otherworldly because you seek the liberation, liberation from your own suffering, from your dukkha, and from the cause of life and death. And once you realize that the harmonization of this worldly and otherworldly practices become the status of the Bodhisattva. So once again, what do we do as human beings and even as heavenly beings? Our practice can just focus on generosity, discipline and meditative concentration. This will guide us towards a better and more ethical human life. And this crosses over with Um, the teachings of Confucianism and worldly religions as well. And secondly, any time you have the mind to transcend Dukkha and rebirth, the realms of Sravaka and Pratyaka Buddha basically turns our attention towards an understanding of the Four Noble Truths. How is suffering caused? Can we end it? When does it end? And how do we end it? This exploration towards transcendence become a truly transcending one and a liberating one. But ultimately, the Bodhisattva path helps us give rise to the four universal vows to deliver all sentient beings, to end all of our dukkha and suffering, to learn all the teachings, and ultimately strive towards Buddhahood. But all of this begin with the five precepts and the ten holes and deeds. I believe this is also a universal value for anyone seeking an ethical religious life. Because no killing in humanistic Buddhism is basically interpreted as an establishment of respect for all lives. You do not trespass on any life's right to live. Secondly, no stealing. You respect one another's possession and no sexual misconduct. It means you respect one another's integrity, our right to a proper family life, and no lying. It's an honor for yourself and others. And finally, no intoxicants. In other words, no taking of alcohol, no taking of drugs, means you're reserving the right to a clear conscience that leads to clear judgment and awareness. So why are these important? Because the five precepts and the ten wholesome conducts are the starting point of awakening. They are the root and the foundation of spiritual cultivation and the growth of all virtues. And if you don't remember any of these precepts, that's also okay, because this, it's just one rule. Do not trespass on the well-being of oneself and others. And this comes from the norms of conduct, discipline, and the foundation of social order and stability. I give this all to you as a perspective of humanistic Buddhism, because it links from what the Buddha taught, which started from the Four Noble Truths, an understanding of dukkha, its cause, its end, its path, to the awakening of the bodhicitta, where you vow to deliver deliver sentient beings to end your afflictions, to learn the higher insight, and then finally lead everyone towards the goal of liberation, that is Buddhahood. And the practices are all laid out by the Bodhisattva path, such as compassion, that will end your dukkha. Pranya wisdom, that guides you through your way out of the cause of dukkha. And the practice, which is the persistent way to end dukkha, And then finally, to keep vowing so you stay on the path. 
And the four folk, uh, objectives of Four Guangshan does exactly the same thing. When in the form of education, culture, charity, and purification of human minds through spiritual cultivation tells us but one thing, right? Again, how do we lead a good family life? This fam family life is done through the simple attitude towards the Dharma. That is, anytime we come across the teachings, the basic rule is to speak well of the Dharma and put it into practice. Because only by accepting it and giving it a try, will you be truly the benefit beneficent receiver of the Dharma. And secondly, if you can do it well, help others with what you have learned. And thirdly, anytime you're unsure of how this will benefit you, try to make constructive comments and studies of the Dharma instead of meaningless criticisms. Because the meaning of language, especially the meaning of religious language, is not just to communicate. The meaning of religious language is actually to inspire meaningful action that will lead towards better well-being. And so after the perspective, secondly, we're going to perspective. What is the perspective of humanistic Buddhism? And in three simple modes, Venerable Master continued from the value of Venerable Master Tai Shu. He said, in the 21st century, what we need to focus is on is actually to liberate the living rather than the dead. So by living a good life, you won't have to worry about dying a good death. Okay. Secondly, don't just wait for the Buddhas or the monastics to give us blessings. We must trust in our own ability to generate our own blessing. We are our own merit generator. Anytime we speak good, we do good, and anytime we think good. And so in doing that, what is the perspective of humanistic Buddhism? And I would say you're looking at a much more universal and accessible practice. And I coined this as off the cushion mindfulness for the future. In other words, our journey towards awakening through the guidance of mindfulness is no longer on the cushion. It's in the everyday learning starting from young, it's the blending of religion as well as our everyday joy and celebration of life. So in any of these moments, when you're learning, when you're offering your service, when you're singing, when you're sharing your musical talents, when you're telling stories of profound history, what you realize is that you're still practicing mindfulness. Mindfulness is not down on the cushion. It can be 24 seven anytime you're aware of what you're going through. Anytime you have full observation and realization of your thoughts and you understand how not to become attached to it as a false self. And anytime you realize the awareness of this true self comes from this great interconnectedness with everyone else. Your world begins to open up through of the cushion mindfulness done in our everyday life practice. And second of all, a perspective to humanistic Buddhism would be the de-ritualized spiritual cultivation. Okay, so what do I mean by this? It's not through the chanting and prayers that do you start to live ethically. It's actually done through the act of giving by sharing the presence of yourself with others. So in this Master Xingyun model, we no longer seek just our own well-being by chanting and praying for our own well-being, but to share moments of life when we open up the doors of the temple so school children can come through to learn about the values of the three, the three acts of goodness. What is the benefit of doing good? What is the benefit of speaking good? What is the benefit of thinking good? It must start at a young age. And so as you start to grow, this becomes a wonderful Buddhist education where you realize it's actually through the process of acquiring knowledge, sharing knowledge, and internalizing this knowledge through your actions and deeds, do you start to live ethically. You start to show disciplined actions. You start to display improved personal relationships through this development of greater awareness. 
And the third perspective of humanistic Buddhism is a decentralized global development. In other words, from as early as the 15th century, I want to show you the picture of the Great Circle. This was shared with us by Dr. Lewis Lancaster. Towards the end of the 15th century, this is pretty much the complete establishment of Buddhism. Coming from North India, reaching out to Southeast Asia through Sri Lanka by the sea route, reaching out to East Asia in Chang'an, in Japan and in Korea through the Silk Road. This full great circle of Buddhism displayed the mandala development model. And by this, Dr. Lancaster explained it as a satellite establishment where each of our own experience of development of Buddhism happened independently. It happened according to our, our own needs to satisfy our trade needs, our daily needs, our family needs. And as all of these satellites began to establish, somehow they fall into place and complement each other. And at, this, this same, at the same time, there's no central control of how Buddhism should develop. It's a free and open establishment that we see, and this will lead into the 21st century continuously into the West, into America, into Europe, and across Southeast Asia in an even much more diverse way. And the fourth perspective of humanistic Buddhism, which I would like to offer to you, is the life related Buddhist practice, such as the three acts of goodness, the four givings, and the five precepts, all done in our display of music, theater, movies, and animation. So as we look at all of this, we see Buddhism is being done through a practice through the rite of passage in baby blessings for any baby in any country. And leaders politically, economically, socially, religiously will come to really celebrate the culture uh, and the history of each religion in finding the good together. And families will become even closer. So when monastics become renounced, we don't move away from our family. We move closer to our family in bringing them closer together to this higher sense of awareness. So we, great, we learn to better appreciate our interconnectedness in many aspects. And so that being said, we have only an hour to go through the perspective of humanistic Buddhism from my, my angle the development of Buddhism in the Taiwanese history, the changes, the reforms, and the new developments, but much more importantly, the perspective of us moving together towards a much more holistic, but at the same time, diverse, open, and free way of practice. So I'm quite excited to see how humanistic Buddhism would actually develop in the Philippines, in your way, in our way, and in a way that helps us celebrate the togetherness of human humanity, the diversity of religious cultures, the kindness and compassion, which is a common value of Buddhism. So where is the human world? Where is Pure Land? According to a venerable master, right? where is humanistic Buddhism guiding us into the 21st century? It's actually a pure land found in the here and now when we transcend while at the same time respect tradition and history, but continue to establish and find our own answers to what it is to become awakened. And how do we actually embark on the journey of awakening as human beings all together? That would be the goal of our founding master who passed away in February. He says, it doesn't matter, speak your, the language you speak, do the things you want to do, be the people you want to be with and practice and share Buddhism in any way possible. As long as Buddhism is there in any place that the sun shines on, there will be happiness and peace. That is all we strive for. And once again, this is only my humble experience. 
each and every one of you share your story on what humanistic Buddhism will become. And I look forward to hearing your experience too. So thank you very much for listening to the sharing today. And I will be looking forward to your questions and your comments for today. Thank you so much. Okay, and a round of applause for Venerable Miao Guang for such a wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. And after, as noted by the program flow earlier, we're going to be moving into the question and answer period, the open forum, as you will. So I would like to share the mechanics of this uh, Q&A portion. So all questions must be asked through chat only. So if you see your uh, chat box, uh, you can see in the bottom, it says to Sophie, you can direct your message to a specific person, direct them to me, Sophia Podium, if you have any questions, and then I will be repeating them out loud so that the uh, speaker will have a chance to answer your pressing questions, I'm sure. And uh, please do not unmute your microphone and ask the question yourself. The moderator will relay it for you, as I will. And you may use the direct message feature of Zoom to do so. And once more, um, uh, yes, just please direct it to me, and I will repeat it for our uh, uh, honored speaker to answer. So let's give it a while. And we already have a question. OK, <laughs> very fast, very fast. Thank you. Uh, we have one from Clint Tan, who is uh, a member of Sophia, so it's a fellow organization mate of mine. And his question is, uh, let me see. Wh okay. His question is to Venerable Miao Guang, would you enlighten us as to the question of what differentiates um, Orthodox Buddhism and humanistic Buddhism? Um, that this move outside the mentality of orthodox teaching in Catholicism. This is what we need to begin by doing. And so we're just borrowing the word orthodox in terms of the establishment of the Buddhist organizations, especially in the 1950s. And so by orthodox, first of all, you must come from a proper and established Buddhist lineage. For example, Fo Guangshan comes from the Lingji lineage one of the schools that branched out from the from Chan Buddhism. Right? There is um, Lingji Buddhism, there's Haodong Buddhism, there are all kinds of practices. But this particular lineage of Lingji Buddhism is an interesting one. It's the lineage that comes from a stick and shout education. Basically, you are beaten into your way of enlightenment. So anytime you're not doing right, your teacher shouts at you right, and beats you up. And you would see stories about these Chan masters, right? Disciples and masters like beating at each other, screaming at each other. But that whole idea is to kind of like shout you out of all your all of your delusions, right? In the moments when you're so shocked, you have no other time to think about any delusive thoughts, but to turn directly towards the most pressing issue. That is, can you become awakened? And of course, that later on in the 19th century throughout mainland China, right, became a, a more agriculture oriented Chan monastery lifestyle, where you depended on your daily practices to understand the reality of life and to understand the nature of your mind. That's one lineage. There are also other lineages that relied heavily on the teachings of the sutras, for example, the Tiantai lineage that believed in the oneness, the one vehicle teaching that we all share Buddha nature. So any Buddhist leader or religious practitioner that is considered quote unquote unorthodox, it means he or she is not able to explain the history of his or her lineage. You're not able to provide a family chart, a historical chart of your teachers and masters. So in other words, a lineage will represent a long established way of practice and teaching that sustains a monastic community through the times and guides us towards 
again, the ethical lifestyle of the Buddhist practitioner, a disciplined one, a mindful one, and also a bodhisattva one. And so in the Zaijiao period, you will see, you know, probably a, a lady who would just pick up a wooden fish, start to chant and say, hey, I can offer services to offer deliverance um, services, but they don't offer any teaching. They don't know where the teacher, who their teachers were. And so when humanistic Buddhism is defined by what the Buddha taught, we come from the lineage of Shakyamuni Buddha, whose original intent is simply to strive for the well-being of real life for any human being, no matter who you are, no matter who you come from. And it shouldn't be hard to state your lineage if you come from a, an, a proper or quote-unquote an, an orthodox one. So I hope that answers the question because you must have come from some kind of established tradition to understand why your practice is shaped this way. And only by understanding why your practice is shaped this way, will you be able to sustain it in your everyday life. I guess it's the same with the way you sing, the way you perform, right? the way you think philosophy, isn't it? In philosophy, you have some kind of lineage too, and you have to really abide by that to really establish, you know, your part of this lineage. So I'm going to stop at that. Thank you so much, Venerable Miao Guang. Clint, I hope that answers your question. He's nodding. Yes, he is. Okay, he is satisfied. <laughs> He's very happy. Thank you so much. And now we have questions from the chat from, forgive me if I am pronouncing your name incorrectly, Kiat Ni Ho from Perth. I hope I'm, I hope <laughs> that was an okay uh, pronunciation. So she asks, uh, how do you see the, I believe this is AI development? within the perspective of humanistic Buddhism era? Okay. Ah, the good old AI question. Will we be replaced by AI? Will we be taken over by AI? You know, would AI decide how we live life? Okay. Yes and no. Yes, if you, if you stop yourself from the process of awakening. Okay. AI to me now is uh, a prediction of patterns, a prediction of patterns based on collective knowledge and experience created by human beings that is dumped onto a database. So however creative AI can be, it's only the limited combinations of the data that you feed to it, logically. And it happens, we need it. It, it makes life much more convenient, right? It helps you draft a letter it helps you find answers to knowledge much quicker without spending two hours around how to translate one word. So AI is meant to make, make life more convenient for us. It's only convenient for human beings who have a sense of awakening, who understands what AI is doing for us. But if you take it for granted, if you accept AI without an awareness of your own sense of awakening, your own sense of creativity, your own sense of infinite possibilities in humanity, then you're doomed because you will be so accustomed to fixed answers, prepared knowledge. But answers cannot just be one. If you allow yourself and even everyone in your community to just accept one single type of answer or question, then you're doomed, isn't it? There are 136 people in this Zoom session. And if we have a question, we're supposed to have 1,3600 1, answers to all of it because each and every one of us can create so many different types of answers to what awakening is. But if you sit there and wait for AI to tell you what it's meant to be and you think, ah, this is it, you're doomed. And so as we are taught to question life and to inquire into the purpose of life as taught by the Buddha, we do the same towards what AI is doing for us. Challenge it, rise above it, and know how to use AI. So people once asked me, will translators be replaced by AI? And I say, yes, passive translators will be replaced by AI, but creative translators who know how to use AI will never be replaced. 
Who's the slave? Who's the master? The whole Buddhist education is about us being our own master. So the question is simple. Right? It's going to help us in the development of humanistic Buddhism. As long as you remember, you, can, you ask you your own, your own master. I refer to Venerable Master Xingyun as my teacher because sometimes people ask me, why do you call him master? Does he own you? Which is quite true because it's an honorific title that we refer to our founder. But to clarify that mistake, I just, and I say, he's a teacher who inspired me to think independently. So in the face of AI, may you continue to think independently, continue to question the limit, limit, limitedness of what AI is giving to you, and to doubt whether AI has provided all the answers. Then you will rise above AI and turn AI into your greatest assistance. Be your own master. Okay, thank you so much. I hope that answers your question. There's a round of applause given in the chat, so I think <laughs> that's a sign of <laughs> that's a sign of an affirmation there. And now we have another question in the chat. Venerable Master Sing Yun has a lot of sayings about Guan Yin. Some sayings, such as doing Guan Yin, is specific. However, Dong Guan Yin is also advocated by Tai Shu. Uh, my question is, what is the specific contribution of Venerable Master Sing to the Guan Yin? Thank you so much. Okay. That is her question. All right. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what I, I'm not sure if I understand what Dong Guan Yin is. But um, I can answer the latter part of the question, which I can also read. Right? The specific contribution of the Venerable Master to the faith of Guan Yin. And um, I would say uh, a new perspective he actually gave to us about Guan Yin is that we don't need to be saved by Guan Yin. We can, but we don't need to. Okay. So he divides faith into primary school level high school level, tertiary education level, and PhD level. So in primary school level, you are still being fed knowledge. So the primary school level of Guan Yin faith is you're waiting there to be saved. It's okay, we all need it, right? In our darkest days, I also call out to Guan Yin to save me. But as I enter um, secondary level, I start to ask who is Guan Yin? He says that, he says, you need to think about who is Guan Yin. Right. Is it really the statue up on high on the altar? Is it really the deity who descends from high above and dressed up in this ancient Chinese white robe? You know, I mean, today, go onto the supermarket you know, or into the shopping mall. If you see a lady walking in that white costume, you're going to be so scared, aren't you? You're not going to be happy to see Guan Yin. So that obviously is not the only image of Guan Yin. Okay. So on the secondary level, we ask ourselves, who is Guan Yin? And on the tertiary education level, right, we think about what actually made Guan Yin Guan Yin. Right? What is the quality of Guan Yin? Right? He observes the sounds of the world, reaches out to the sounds of cries for help, and offers a help that is suitable to every individual, isn't it? So there is that creativity in there and the, and the endless possibilities of the fact that Guan Yin is someone who caters to your needs and almost promises deliverance as long as you believe in Guan Yin. Then what happens at PhD level? You become a part of the production line. Right? You take part in the production of Guan Yin and say, what if I also have the ability to own Can I specify that? it to say, why does humanistic? Oh. Yeah. So as we think about how to cater to the needs of human beings, it's not exclusive to Guan Yin. You're doing it as a businessman. You're doing it as a philosophy teacher. Right? You're doing it as a whole brain development you know, master. You, turn, you tend to the individual needs of every living being. Yeah, so even on that level, he, I believe his greatest contribution is to awaken our potential to also be Guan Yin ourselves. Right? Instead of waiting for Guan Yin to save you, why don't you be someone else's Guan Yin in every small part you can take? Right? So I, I really love this saying, you, know, you cannot wait until the day when you have gathered all your ducks to cross the road. Sometimes you just have to gather however many you can and just take a leap and dash across the road. Right? So how many, however many ducks you have in your hand, you can, it's enough for you to become Guan Yin. 
you just need to cross the road okay? and don't get run over, of course, that needs a bit of skill. Okay? And so be your own guaning, be other people's guaning would be his greatest contribution. Okay, thank you for that response, Venerable Miao Guang. We see a thumbs up <laughs> coming through. So that's a, we see another round of applause. So we have time for at least I think at least one or two more questions. We have a question here from uh from the chat, um, from Alexander Anthony Toby Xiao. Please forgive me if I'm uh, mispronouncing your last name there. Uh, what is the perspective of humanistic Buddhism on the current economic inequalities in the world and what should be done about it? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Uh, the question is, what is the perspective of humanistic Buddhism on the current economic inequalities in the world and what should be done about it? Okay. Um... I think I read this from Yuval Harari about 21st century for human beings. He says the biggest problem for humanity right now is that we are all setting out to exploit each other. We only want to benefit from each other, but we don't want to benefit one another. That's probably the biggest issue right? in the econ economic sense, right? in the global sense, in the spiritual sense. And so that is why corporate responsibility has become so important, isn't it? Your role, your responsibility for society is not just to make money, to be successful, to be influential. You have a responsible for sustainable life on this earth, on planet earth. And so this is a huge awakening, a top-down awakening, a wonderful approach, I guess, adopted by Bill Gates, by Steve Jobs, Right, by all the leading um, tech, you know, tech people who now believes that whatever they're creating, they're responsible for creating a future of the world. And if you keep exploiting the resources of this planet, and if you keep exploiting the labor and, you know, the, the wealth of other people, this is not going to happen. And so successful businessmen in America are beginning to awaken to the sense of oneness and interconnectedness. Right? In their practices of mindfulness, they don't discover secrets to how to become rich. What they become awakened to is this wonderful connectedness of themselves to the others. There's a podcaster by the name Naval, wonderful man for Puerto Rico, for, from Puerto Rico. He says, you know, any moment you engage in the practice of mindfulness, just by realizing your name, you invoke your interconnectedness to the rest of the world. Okay, so for right now, if I call out to Sir Stephen Shum, when I say Stephen, okay, and you ask, who is Stephen? Okay, Stephen is a man from Malaysia. Okay, so man from Malaysia, a country, where's Malaysia, a part of the earth? Where's the earth? Right, a part of the solar system. Right, where's the solar system? A part of the universe. And who is Stephen? A father, a human being. So what is a human being? One of the species on Earth, alongside all the other animals. Okay, the bipedal most important living being on Earth who has an influence on how life is sustained on the Earth. And who is Stephen? A father. Okay, you're connected to the family. Who is Stephen? A CEO. Who is Stephen? A family or a friend of someone in society. So immediately the moment you call upon a name, you invoke this greater interconnectedness to the rest of the universe. And if you don't realize that, you cannot give rise to this great sense of appreciation to what you want to create for the world. So this is what business entrepreneurs are awakening to nowadays. And I appreciate that. And with this greater sense of insight and wisdom, they have greater concern for humanity. They want to focus more on spirituality as well as insight rather than economic benefits or profits. To them, it's not the most important thing anymore because getting rich is not the greatest concern for them anymore. Yeah, so it places a lot of hope in me to see that these wonderful business entrepreneurs are awakening to the same insight as that of the Buddha, starting from the very simple teaching of interconnectedness. Then how can you not appreciate the greatness of the universe? Right? Who are you to say, you're not worth any existence in this world when you're connected to so many wonderful forms of existence. But if you see that, your life opens up. 
and then there shall be less exploitations in one another. And hopefully, uh, whoever asked this question, right, when you're connected to any chain of the economic development, right, you break these vicious cycles, you awaken minds, you bring about greater changes. And so again, it's all about awakening. Yeah, sorry for being so old fashioned, but I'm really kind of stuck on this awakening process. Thank you. All right, and I think we have about enough time for one more question. So in the chat, we have uh, Miss Glidal Grace Baya, who uh, asks, the fourth perspective mentioned was decentralized global development. Was there any practice developed that was against the practice of Buddhism, such as misconception, and was acted if there was, how did the Buddhism community correct or deal with it? Okay. Yeah, it's everywhere, isn't it? Um, mispractices, misunderstandings, for example, the practice of live release. It was, it was meant to be good. It was meant to be uh, an intention to free life from the cruelty of humanity, but it only worsened it. So the only way to improve it is not to participate in it. And the mispractice of people paying for ritual services I pay you for deliverance of my grandma. You know, how, how does that even work? Right. And it has to come from an internalized sense of faith and this great trust in fully ordained monastics to complete that remembrance for our loved ones. And it's got to come from right faith. And so anytime you don't feel a sense of peace, you paid so much money to whoever you don't know and does the chanting, and then you don't feel a sense of peace. Right. You, st you still dream about your grandma in bad places, yeah, then, you know, switch to a different practice. Right. It's ongoing. You're going to see unorthodox monastics right, who are trying to make a profit out of faithful devotees, which is heartbreaking to see. But what we also need to do is for every learner of the Dharma to establish right church faith, right view and right understanding in yourself, so that we are not acting out of greed. Right? I'm not acting out of any benefit from my own merits when I learn the Dharma. I mean, you want to. You want, you want a better personality. right? You want a better life. You want improved person, um, personal relationships. You want a better job. You want to be more at peace with whatever you're doing in this world. This is what we seek. But any moment you discover that these pursuits become a sense of greed, then you might need to back down a little bit because this greed will become what actually encourages mispractices. So it's a two-way street. So I would say, well, go out there, right? um, interact with these practitioners, see for yourself, experience it. And if you don't feel well, then it's okay. It's okay to turn away. You have every right to turn away. But before you turn away, give yourself time to communicate, experience and observe. Right? It's really in your own hands. Okay, thank you so much. And I think that wraps up our Q&A period. I would like to thank everyone for sending in such wonderful questions and for Venerable Miao Guang, who is our um, source of enlightenment for this. I believe for that's this, not uh... true. You are your own source of enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> and now we come to, a cl we come to um, the latter portion of this program where sadly it must come to a close as all good things must end. And so we would like first to present the Certificate of Appreciation for Venerable Miao Guang, and I will be reading it in full. The Humanistic Buddhism Center Philippines, in cooperation with the University of San Carlos Department of Philosophy, presents this Certificate of Appreciation to Venerable Miao Guang in gratitude and recognition of her time and presence in sharing invaluable insights during the second Humanistic Buddhism lecture series, Perspective and Prospective, given this 27th of July in the year 2023 by Zoom meeting, signed by Venerable Miao Jing and Dr. Ruby Suazo. A round of applause, please, everyone. Thank you very much. It's indeed been a great pleasure and an honor. Hmm. And as I, as I mentioned, as we are coming to a close, we'd like 
to in uh, we have a special speaker, our very own chair of the Department of Philosophy. Uh, he will be giving the closing remarks. Please welcome Dr. Ruby Suazo. Thank you very much, Austin. I just realized that this uh, event is to happen today, July 27. So uh, dear colleagues and uh, friends, auspicious morning. As we come to the end of this enlightening, enlightening discussion, I am filled with a profound sense of gratitude for the insights and perspectives that Venerable Miao Guang, the Deputy Chancellor of Fok Wangshan Institute of uh, Humanistic Buddhism, have shared with us today. Her exploration of how this ancient religious faith revitalized itself to ensure its survival, yet continued to root itself in compassion, wisdom, and social engagement has provided us with a glimpse into the profound impact that it can have on individuals and societies alike in the here and now, rather than focusing on the afterlife as the living are liberated rather than the dead. <clears throat> From its inception, Humanistic Buddhism has emphasized the importance of integrating spiritual practice with active participation in the world. It reminds us that enlightenment is not an isolated pursuit, but one that is intimately connected to the welfare of all beings. By, rec by recognizing the interdependence of all things, humanistic Buddhism encourages us to cultivate empathy, kindness, and a deep sense of responsibility for the well-being of others. Throughout her discussion, we have witnessed the transformative power of humanistic Buddhism in addressing contemporary challenges. Knowing Fok Wang Shan, its emphasis on engaged spirituality has spurred numerous social initiatives, including charitable works, environmental conservation efforts, and education programs. By bringing the teachings of Buddhism to bear on practical issues, humanistic Buddhism inspires individuals to lead lives of meaning and service, fostering harmony and compassion that beautifies and purifies the rapidly changing world. Looking ahead, we stand on the threshold of a promising future for humanistic Buddhism. In an era marked by increasing globalization and technological advancement, the principles of this human-centered philosophy are more relevant than ever. Its teachings provide us with the moral and ethical compass needed to navigate the complex challenges of our time, while also offering solace, peace, and guidance to individuals seeking purpose and fulfillment. However, as we embrace the prospective future of humanistic Buddhism, let us remain vigilant. Let us ensure that its core tenets of compassion, equality, and social engagement are upheld in the face of potential distortions or delusions. Let us continue to explore, study, and deepen our understanding of this profound tradition, drawing from its timeless wisdom to foster a more compassionate and just society. Humanistic Buddhism offers us a profound path of transformation, a path that combines personal awakening with active engagement in the world. It invites us to cultivate wisdom, compassion, and ethical conduct in our daily lives and encourages us to work tirelessly for the well-being of all sentient beings to achieve pure land in the here and now. As we bid farewell today, I would like also to thank Venerable Miao Jing, Director of Humanistic Buddhism Center Philippines and Abbess of Fok Wang Shan Mabuhay Temple, Manila, and Dr. Maria Majori Purino of the Department of Philosophy of the University of San Carlos for successfully heading this activity. The same words of gratitude to the Department of Philosophy of the University of San Carlos together with its faculty and students co-hosting this event. So all of you who join us in this morning's activity, thank you very much and may your journey be one of deep insight and boundless compassion. Good day. And ladies and gentlemen, we would like to thank you all for being here. That's 128 participants who came from all over the world to join us in this one gathering of uh, understanding and an opportunity for us to uh, come together as people of learning, as those who wish to learn and those who are curious. And uh, before everyone leaves, uh, we're going to have a, a document, a commemorative picture.
for everyone. So please turn on your cameras, have a big smile on your faces, and we're going to have uh, our tech team screenshot. Don't worry, everyone looks beautiful today, so no need to be uh, self-conscious. Everyone is looks wonderful today. And one, Josh, are you ready? Tech team. <laughs> Windows button and print screen. Dungana. Yep. Okay. We're going to get the screenshot in three, two, one. Smile. And keep smiling. <laughs> There's five pages. Keep smiling. <laughs> okay. And we are good. Thank you so much, everyone. For joining us on such a wonderful day and have a wonderful rest of your day thank you everyone yeah. enjoy your lunch thank you <laughs> thank you for the inspiration thank you everybody thank you for your time bye 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 bye, bye. bye.